Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, FPT, FPT Compliance Update with the ATO. I'm Tony and I'll be your moderator today. Very shortly, I'll be handing you over to our Chair, Sasha Savage from Viva Energy. Sasha will introduce our presenter and commentators and share the agenda for today's session. Before I do so, I just wanted to let you know you can submit questions at any time throughout the webinar via your control panel and we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as possible. If you would like to print out the copy of the presentation, it is available as a downloadable resource from the handout section of your control panel. I think we're ready to begin, so I'll hand over to Sasha. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, FBT Compliance Seminar webinar hosted by CCH. Uh, Sasha Savage is my name and I'll be your chair today. Uh, I represent the Viva Energy Group and uh, I'll be coming from an angle of an, of an industry practitioner, uh, so part of my responsibility in addition to mainstream indirect taxes is, is very much in the employment tax space, so I have carriage for uh, fringe benefits tax returns, uh, payroll taxes as well, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to add a bit of an angle uh, to you know how things are done in the industry and, and and just share the experience and also prompt our panel throughout the process. So we've had in excess of uh, 800 registrations today, so FBT is proving to be a uh, very popular topic as always, which is which is great to see. Uh, we're, we're fortunate to have in the room today uh, Catherine Willis, the, the ATR Assistant Commissioner and Case Leader, will be taking a lead on uh, delivering uh, today's presentation. Uh, I'd also like to welcome back uh, Greg Kent, uh, partner from PwC, and Elizabeth Lucas, partner from Grant Thornton, uh, who will be part of our expert panel today, and we'll, we'll share some uh, insights in, in responding to a lot of the questions that uh, we've received in advance of the webinar. Uh, what we'll try and do today is uh, address a lot of those questions during the presentation uh, and also you will also have the opportunity to ask additional questions which we'll take on notice and uh, address either during uh, the webinar or immediately uh, uh, post the webinar time permitting. So uh, having said that, uh, I think We'll, we'll move on and uh, commence with our presentation. So I'll hand over to Catherine Ellis from, from the ATO. Good afternoon, everyone. Look, what I'm hoping to do this afternoon is to run through um, sort of a, a number of things that will hopefully be of assistance to you and be relevant to you, to you um, in relation to uh, complying with your FBT obligations uh, for, this, for this FBT year. Um, some of the things that I talk about today will probably be familiar to you and will be more by way of uh, reminders and, and uh, in some cases it will just be an update perhaps on, on progress of things that have been uh, sort of trundling along uh, the last uh, year or two. Um, I think we'll have a little bit of a refresh of some of the things that um, have changed recently just so they're still at the top of our mind. And the other thing I really want to focus on this afternoon um, where we might spend a bit of our time and, and I'll be certainly welcoming comments from Greg and Elizabeth. Some of the, the topics that um, seem to come across the ATO's desk on um, a regular basis, uh, I want to identify those for you and perhaps explain um, where they're coming from, uh, and also to some of our priorities going forward in terms of uh, areas which we want to focus on, compliance or, or guidance, and to explain some of our new products as well too. I think the, the last year has been a, a year of a significant change at the ATO in relation to the way it communicates um, issues um, in FBT and more broadly, and you might see some changes in the way that um, um, administrative issues and, and uh, changes in law and so forth are communicated, and I wanted to bring you up to date with um, what you're going to be seeing coming up. So I will move to our first slide, um, if I can. Right. Uh, look, the first, the first slide shouldn't contain any information that is of any great surprise. Uh, I suppose my only comment is that we still do see that there are issues with um, uh, people who aren't uh, 
completing their lodgements on time or payments on time. Uh, these dates are, are by way of a reminder. Um, we also had a couple of questions in advance. I think one question that came in was, if, if um, I don't um, owe any fringe benefits tax, if I don't have any um, fringe benefit uh, amounts owing, do I have to um, make a lodgement? And certainly our guidance is that um, you may be registered to pay SBT, um, but there may be reasons why you don't have to lodge an SBT return because there's no fringe benefits taxable amount um, that applies to you. Um, it would be in your interest to lodge an SBT non-lodgement advice or otherwise contact us. That simply uh, saves um, uh, the ATO from having to, to chase you and, and uh, it's more administration for, for you and for us. So uh, I suppose the message is if you don't believe that you need to lodge an SBT return in a particular year, let us, let us know and there, there are forms and, and ways of doing that and we have some information on our website um, in that respect. And of course, if, if there are problems uh, if, uh, in meeting due dates, please again do, do contact someone, do contact a, um, someone at the ATO and, and speak to us about um, circumstances in which, which there can be deferral. Now, we also had a, a second question that came in on the subject of uh, lodgements and so forth. Um, and the question was, uh, why do we have to file SBT returns via post? Can't we file returns online? Now, I, I took that um, question to some of my colleagues. Um, I believe that probably is a, a question asked by someone who uh, self-repairs their return who doesn't have uh, SBR-enabled software. Um, otherwise, tax agents um, who do have that software can either use that software or um, use the ELS system. In relation to why um, we uh, still have uh, paper SBT returns, uh, it is something that is on our radar. We are looking at, obviously, uh, it's a government-wide movement to move more online, to move to a, a digital approach. Um, getting uh, these things set up and systems set up is incredibly resource-intensive, uh, takes a lot of time. So certainly we do take that feedback on board. Um, it's just a question of um, actually getting a, a sort of a nice stable system, system up and running. So. Um, I think it's a case of uh, perhaps watch this, watch this space um, in terms of uh, development in that regard. SBT rates, um, again, rates and gross up factors. Oh, uh, I don't think there's any surprise um, with that and I'll also just run through the third slide um, again with um, a series of uh, rates and gross up factors. And so at this point I'd be happy to um, perhaps stop and see if there's anything that um, Greg or Elizabeth wanted to raise in relation to rates, returns, lodgements or anything like that in terms of uh, their practical experience? Um, not, not really. Um, I guess one thing that comes up a little bit for any not-for-profits that are online, um, the, the meal entertainment and, and entertainment facility leasing expenses cap of the 5000 gross up. It's just uh, interesting to point out that that's a cap set at a gross up level that doesn't change from the 5,000 figure this year to next year and therefore the non-gross up figure, if you like, does change. Whereas when you're looking at the caps for the other sort of general categories of benefits, the 31,177 gross up value is what changes so that the, you know, going down to 30,000, so the non-gross up figure doesn't change. So it's just kind of the reverse, um, just keeping that in mind, I suppose. Okay. We might move on now to sort of the, the next perhaps uh, part of the presentation which is about law updates and there hasn't been a sort of a huge amount of legislative change in, in the last couple of months but there have been a number of sort of things that have happened over the last 12 to 18 months that um, I, I think it's probably useful to um, refresh our memories on these topics because they, they're becoming pertinent now and also to um, where we have received queries or feedback or concerns have been raised about some of those topics um, over the last 12 months. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, flag some of those issues as well too and, and hopefully what we're trying to do about them. So the topics will run through adjusted taxable income, single touch payroll reporting, uh, the full business concession for portable electronic devices, um, some of the, the work being done around salary package meal entertainment benefits and the business use of employee cards. So if we move on to the, the impact of fringe benefits on adjusted taxable income, uh, this is something which um, applies from 1st of January this year. 
uh, the grossed up value of fringe benefits will be used for the purposes of calculating um, adjusted taxable income and reported on employees' PAYG summary. Um, this has an impact uh, more around certain uh, income tests uh, which rely on FBT information such as family assistance and so forth, um, uh, things that are sort of administered by the Department of uh, Human Resources. Uh, there are certain uh, fringe benefits that it doesn't apply to, and that's the third bullet point on that slide. Um, fringe benefits sourced from cert certain not-for-profit institutions that are exempt from fringe benefits tax. Um, and they, they are entities generally which are set out within Section 57A of the fringe benefits legislation. Now, the reason why we wanted to draw this to your attention is that um, there is also, obviously because um, this is where we have a link to the Department of Human Services, there is um, some material on the DHS website, and we've had a number of queries come in about that. Um, the DHS website uh, refers to uh, these changes um, and mentions exempt employers, um, which might suggest that it's a, a much broader range of not-for-profit entities than are actually covered by these changes. So I suppose something we'd just like to flag is that we probably just want to um, flag that we're a little bit concerned that perhaps a broader range of not-for-profits might incorrectly think that these changes apply to them, that they are exempt, so that there's a broader range of debatable employers when um, it really is just for those not-for-profits that are specified in the changes. Uh, so just, just to flag that, um, it, it may be that um, everybody's already across that, uh, but it is something that has been, been raised with us. So I'll make a comment on, on that if I can, um, because I think it's something that employees are quite aware of, particularly in a salary packaging context, but it also has application where the employer is providing benefits outside of a salary packaging context. And employees are particularly sort of on top of it when they're eligible for family tax benefit, which of course is changing coming up, but um, family tax benefit under the old rules and childcare benefit, mm -hmm. because those means tests in the past only used the taxable value of fringe benefits. And these changes mean that for all employees other than those of the PBI or exempt employers, it will now be the gross up value of benefits that you that is used for those means tests. So family tax benefit and childcare benefit in particular are affected. Um, but it's also good to know that the other things that employees seem to ask a lot of questions around the HEX repayments and child support payments. And those ones aren't affected because those means tests already use the gross up value of fringe benefits for, for all employees across the board. So. Um, yeah, so, so that seems to be the area that we get the questions around anyway. So, so the, the degrossing, I suppose, concept is is uh, restricted to a limited number of entities. Mm -hmm. We have updated um, our material on the ATO website, um, and there is a if, even if the link in the PowerPoint doesn't work, it does give you a, a reference number for a, a um, informational document there, QC one six one double two, which will provide some some further information, and, and we'll keep updating that as we get feedback and, and queries. If I can just jump in for a second. Uh, so in relation to this measure, perhaps either for Greg or, or Elizabeth, are there any other practical issues for, for taxpayers to consider at the time they're preparing their, their lodgements, etc.? Any Any other hurdles along the way in terms of systems or timing? Not really in relation to their FBT yeah. returns, yeah. it's more about the impact for the employees this yeah. one and sort of being on top of being able yeah. to answer their questions yeah. without, of course, providing financial advice if you're not mm. going to do so. Most of the time that we see challenges around this is where an employee, employer, I should say, gets mm. their FBT wrong and needs to make an amendment and then yeah. it goes and needs to make adjustments and yeah. um, that gets particularly difficult about having the consequential impact mm -hmm. on, on these. So, if there's ever a reason to get your FBT right in the first instance, this is one of them. And look, it's another example of where FBT isn't a standalone um, concept. Uh, it has it has implications. Obviously, it links into to, to government payments, not just income tax, but but other sorts of government benefits as well too. I might move on to the next topic, which is single touch payroll reporting, and again. Uh, this is something which uh, overall government approach is to um, reduce red tape, to reduce paperwork, to reduce admin, to 
take a more digital, more online approach. And single touch payroll reporting uh, is, I suppose, sort of a, a tax emanation of that approach. So this um, uh, is supposed to align with standard business processes, payroll cycles. It um, encourages and allows employers to report their PAYG withholding and their superannuation contributions through to the ACO through um, this particular uh, software. Um, that means that um, the information can be provided to the ACO um, sort of, you know, at just in time, at the same time that the information um, appears. It can be uplifted and provided to relevant government agencies such as DHS um, and hopefully that means that in most cases employers don't need to go through the process of manually creating um, annual payment summaries. Now, um, the phasing in of single touch payroll reporting uh, depends on the number of employees. So 20 employees or more um, can pick up the single touch payroll um, approach from 1 July this year. It will be mandatory um, from 1 July 2018. However, employers with uh, 19 employees or fewer than 19 employees can um, uh, voluntarily report to the ATO um, through the single touch payroll approach from um, 1st of July. Um, so I, I suppose we've had a couple of uh, queries received um, uh, Generally, um, first of all, okay, um, payment summaries aren't required um, generally, that's correct. We're also aware of um, some confusion and some feedback around uh, what do we do with uh, employee um, amounts such as reportable fringe benefits tax amounts um, and other sorts of payments. It might even be, for example, if, if an employee leaves partway through a year, which aren't nice, neat, periodic things. So unlike salary payment, which is a nice, neat, fortnightly payment, and, and SGC, which is a nice, neat, um, periodic payment. What happens if you have these, these sort of lumpy things or things that happen um, in a non-periodic fashion? Um, now, again, there is some, some guidance on um, our website um, around that. Um, there will be the ability to um, prepare uh, payment summaries to reflect those, um, those sort of non-periodic amounts. Um, and our guidance has been um, updated to, to reflect that. Um, from an SBT perspective, um, it still does offer employers, um, particularly the larger employers with more than 20 employees, with the option of submitting a, a detailed uh, report to the ATO which sets out those reportable fringe benefits amounts. Uh, so it's still something that I think people are working through in, in a practical sense and again we will keep on updating um, our advice on that. Um, there is a, a, a more recently updated, I think we've attached to this PowerPoint reference to some media releases from the, the former assistant treasurer and, and some, uh, some bills in our consultation paper. I think our consultation paper has now been updated uh, as of December last year to really set out some of these sort of practical issues and, and I'd certainly encourage you to have a look at that. But again, I'll, I'll throw to, to Greg and Elizabeth who possibly have some more practical experience with these things. Um, I think the interesting thing about it is um, we've been waiting for these rules to sort of take effect for a period of time now. Um, I'd be interested, and I don't know whether this is a question you can answer, Catherine, how, how many have voluntarily elected to, to provide their information through this forum to date? I don't know. I can certainly try to find out um, what sort of uptake we are getting. Yeah. Oh, oh, to be honest, I. I haven't had a lot of clients talk to me about moving to this yet. Yeah. I think they're deferring to the wait and see. The, the wait and see, yeah. Just to, um, I don't know. I'm not sure whether that's a mixture of uncertain whether it's going to be extended again or whether they're just waiting till the systems are up and running and tested and and then comply from that perspective. Not not sure either what the reasoning is, but I certainly. I'm raising this in talks to our clients around the country and you know, not seeing that there's much uptake of it yet. They're probably waiting until it's mandatory, I suppose. Mm. And I think we're, sort of, um, we're still quite early in the year. We're still in February mm. and mm. I think a lot of the more recent guidance and discussion and communications was towards the end of last year. So um, we're still getting questions that are coming out of that. Mm. Uh, the next the next topic uh, looked again just a, a reminder. This is something that was flagged um, with effect from one April two thousand and sixteen. 
Um, it expands, uh, uh, look, a number of employee benefits are already exempt from fringe benefits, tax and, and portable electronic devices were on the radar in, in terms of um, those exemptions. Um, from the 1st of April last year, it will extend to small businesses that provide employees with more than one work-related portable um, electronic device in FBT. Previously, um, the FBT exemption was limited to just the, the one item per FBT year for items that had a, a substantially identical function, unless your, your portable device had broken down and it's been replaced. Um, just to, to sort of flag that we are looking at um, employers who meet the test of the small business um, and that uh, there still needs to be um, a, a qualification or criteria around primary use of the employee's in employment. And again, we have some, some guidance on, online around that. So uh, perhaps not a, a major expansion, but hopefully something that um, uh, is a convenient thing for uh, um, employers. Is anything this? No, just I think this, I think the ATO has been quite reasonable with because um, there's, there's the law and then there's the administration interpretation of the law, and I think the ATO has been quite reasonable in allowing employees and employers to provide multiple devices, albeit, and allow them to distinguish between those devices, such as a, a phone's different from a laptop is different from an iPad, for example. So I think that approach has been quite reasonable. We still get quite a few questions from clients around uh, particularly, what, where, how do you have, how do you pass that primary for use in the employment test, and um, is is it dual purpose sufficient? Um, what we always say is that it has to be primarily. So that has to be your main. The pri the private element has to be secondary. So you can use the device still for private on weekends and so forth but the intention of the employer in providing that advice has to be the dominant purpose of business. I think that raises a really interesting issue when you think about bring your own device uh, programs and employees, you know, bringing their own mobile phone to work and having those costs paid. You know, if they've purchased their phone, probably for private reasons, and now are bringing it to work and having some costs um, paid by their employer, probably the exemption doesn't apply because it's probably not being provided primarily for use in their employment activities. But I guess the way that an employer can look at that is, well, perhaps they just pay for the business portion of the cost, therefore, so that they don't trigger an FBT liability for the organisation. But obviously that then means getting declarations from the employees. Mm. Oh, and do you see, here's a question from me, um, particular types of businesses, industries, types of jobs, where it's particularly pertinent or, or particular oh. issues arise or? I think it's widespread now. Yeah. Like everybody uses Everybody, them. yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, that's not to say every organisation funds those devices for their employees, um, but I, don't, I wouldn't say there's a particular industry. It's, it is widespread no, It's probably just becoming more common for employers to consider BYOD policies now. Whereas Certain technology might have been a, a novelty or a nice to have five or so years ago. Um, it's everyday part of working life now. Move on. Um, the next category again is something that has been on our radar since April last year, and again, just I suppose just by a way of reminder, and also um, to let people know that um, we probably got more up to date and better guidance. Um, on the ATO's website at the moment, but this, this relates to um, salary packaged a meal and entertainment benefits. Um, and look, bearing in mind, um, it relates to uh, everything on, on salary packaged as well too. Um, some of the changes are pertinent to all employers. Other changes um, uh, will affect not-for-profit employers. Um, so in terms of the sort of the blanket things that will affect um, all employers, um, it, there's a need now to report all salary package, meal entertainment and entertainment facility leasing expenses and they we include on the employee's payment summary. Um, bearing in mind we just had a discussion about uh, not having payment summaries for uh, uh, simple touch payroll, but anyway. Uh, and uh, there will be some changes around methodologies. 50-50 split method and 12-week register method cannot be used for valuing salary package, meal entertainment or entertainment facility leasing expenses. 
um, it will need to be valued using the actual method. Um, again, uh, not-for-profit employers, uh, there are some changes which are specific to them, which I'll just run through on the, the second slide. Um, we've updated our, our guidance and advice on uh, those uh, particular um, items as well too. Well, the main queries I get around these ones is what's in the net for salary packaging with meal entertainment and the entertainment facility leasing expenses, you know, the dining or takeaway meals and, you know, all those kinds of things. So I guess employers just need to be careful about setting policies around what they will accept and what they won't accept as, as eligible expenses under these salary packaging arrangements. Normally, so I think this change has had the benefit of it really being only one of, one of the sole technical changes for the year, so people have sort of focused on it. Uh, everyone I speak to around it I think has got a good understanding of how the, how the changes apply. So obviously the first compliance period hasn't happened yet, so it's coming up, so that will be the interesting. But the you know, mid-year reviews we've done of how organisations and packaging bureaus have adapted to this. Um, there across. The, the final um, law update, and I think as Greg's point out, probably it's not really something which is particularly new um, uh, and applies from the 1st of April, but these, these are really income tax deduction rules which have changed uh, but which have a um, sort of a, a sort of crossing over with FBT in terms of um, valuation methodology and how to um, substantiate um, expenses as well too. Uh, so uh, there are two methods um, now available to uh, calculate the work-related expense deductions, uh, which are set out on, on the slide. Um, and uh, just an advice there that we um, will accept um, FBT returns uh, based on 2014-2015 uh, rates under transitional arrangements um, going forward, um, there will be a different rate. Uh, the link to the Simplify the Car Expense Substantiation Method um, document has actually been updated. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, if people have access to our Small Business New Room, uh, there is a Small Business News Room, I should say, um, there is some material uh, there on claiming car expenses and how to substantiate those, and there's also some um, if you look on our website under the general heading car expenses, there is some, uh, some more recent and, and updated advice um, in quite detail what you can and can't claim calculating deductions and substantiating deductions um, on, on that uh, uh, piece of guidance there. Again, uh, something which uh, really goes back to April last year. Elizabeth and Greg, what, what's the echo been on, on this change from any of your clients? Have you had much inquiry and feedback? Just the issue of um, a lot of paying, it's more the PAYG issue, paying cents per kilometre reimbursements to employees and having to pay at higher rates than the 66 cents because of awards or because of history and that's what they do or whatever and therefore having a PAYG obligation. I find it comes up much less often in terms of an FBT context. Yeah, there were some challenges for that from memory for the first few months of the year where um, the comms around this hadn't, like the legislation yeah. hadn't passed around yeah. it yet, yeah. and yet the 66 cents was already in play. So there was, there was the initial challenge, but uh, most of that's well, its way out now. Yeah, we, we sort of found from an industry context that there was a lot of old rates stuck in spreadsheets and types of documentation where people were used to claiming at two tier rates or a couple of different rates before. Yeah, depending on how many CCs the car had. So uh, I think that's certainly been a challenge to sort of eradicate that and cleanse and ensure that if you are claiming on sense of one identity to that standard rate. Personally, I'm very disappointed the talk percent of cost has gone, but I should yeah. my personal taxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of the questions that's come up a bit is around electric cars as well. And so um, the 66 cent rate obviously applies to electric cars in the same way as it applies mm. to other cars, but maybe we can sort of tangent off onto a, another question that's arisen in relation to when you're looking at the operating cost of a car for the operating cost method of calculating FBT, how you can calculate the cost 
of the electricity for an electric car. You know, if you've been charging it at home, for instance, how you apportion that. Um, did, is there any yeah, guidance from the yeah, tax yeah, office? Elizabeth, Elizabeth did, did raise this question with me before the session, and I suppose the answer to that is um, I did ask around, and um, they thought that was a fabulously interesting, <laughs> 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 a novel, a novel one, and um, certainly something that um, that people uh, will, will be looking into. We we actually sort of trawled through our our recent databases. Um, uh, we've had inquiries um, over electric cars and. and characterisation and treatment of electric cars generally, so obviously electric cars are a hot topic actually going back a couple of years, but nothing as specific as, as looking at the input, which is, you know, essentially mm. the fuel. So um, I, I might cheat on that one and say that um, we might need to take that one on, on notice and because and, uh, uh, I think these electric cars are obviously something which are going to be more popular mm. going forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's just another example of trying to, I suppose, adapt legislation from 1986 to um, 21st mm. century uh, technology. Mm. We've managed it with portable devices, but we haven't got quite as far as electric cars as yet, but um, that, uh, we'll put that issue on the table. Sure, great. I suppose at this point I wanted to go perhaps a, a bit more conceptual uh, and talk about some of the changes recently around ATO advice and guidance and then, then perhaps dig down into how this relates specifically to, to FBT issues. Uh, probably everybody who's worked in the tax profession for a while has got very used to um, sort of the old concepts of private and public uh, rulings. Uh, we have our tax rulings and our tax determinations and you can put in a, a request for a private ruling and so forth. Um, what uh, we are trying to do now, in particular there's been a lot of work done over the last 12 months, is to provide different levels and layers of advice um, to address the different layers of complexity of issues. Uh, different formats uh, to address issues which are sort of pure law and technical questions versus issues which are more about administration and, and practical sorts of things. Uh, there has been uh, quite a lengthy review of um, the ATS public advice. Um, some of our public rulings go back many, many years. Um, I suppose one, one perfect example is, is TR 9626 about um, uh, car parking. Uh, which, is, which has been a hot topic. Uh, they have been um, reviewed um, by academics recently, a number of these rulings to see you know, what are out of date, what needs to be updated. There's actually been a, a separate centre set up at the ATO called Public Advice and Guidance. And uh, certainly a number of things are going to be shelved and refreshed and reviewed. And again, a similar sort of review has been done of um, a private advice uh, products as well too in terms of what do actually people want? Um, you know, is, is it really um, not very efficient to, for someone to put in a ruling request and have to wait months to get an answer when they need something quicker um, and more targeted? Uh, so there's some new advice and guidance products um, appearing. The first one is, is Law Companion Guidelines. And this is a type of public ruling and it's focused on um, how recently enacted tax law or about to be enacted tax law applies. So it's developed um, by the ATO around about the same time as a, a tax bill is being formulated and it's, it's finalised as a, a final product after Royal Assent received. And the idea is that where there's a, a new law which uh, sort of expresses an unfamiliar concept or some sort of new regime or where taxpayers might need to take action um, quickly to comply with new law, in other words something which isn't perhaps straightforward. Um, to sort of give um, taxpayers some guidance as to how the law is likely to be administered by the ATO. Some of the recent examples where we've used law um, companion guidelines are around superannuation reforms, the foreign resident withholding tax and so forth. So nothing on SBT specific so far, uh, but that's one of the, the sorts of products that you might see if we did have law change coming up. Now, practical compliance guidelines are probably uh, a little bit more interest in the um, FBT space. Um, practical compliance guidelines are uh, there to explain how the ATO is going to administer the law. And you will see these uh, in particular where we have some of our safe harbour products um, or where we are dealing with um, things such as um, accepting certain um, uh, record keeping approaches or valuation approaches or something like that. Practical compliance guidelines are there not to, to state or restate the law but to assist people in complying with the law and that's why we're supporting the practical compliance. 
we are trying to um, get in much um, earlier and, and sort of consult on some of these, these uh, technical issues. And, and as I mentioned, you're going to see a lot more things coming through, say, our web page and through digital products um, so that they can sort of be sort of yeah, on, on your, your desk um, in as timely a fashion as possible. Um, I mentioned practical compliance guidelines. So, so the first um, practical compliance guideline was actually the practical compliance guideline which talks about what practical compliance guidelines are. Um, and I think I'll sort of run through um, quickly uh, what that's all about. The uh, first one, probably FBT specific, that we saw last year was the, the fleet car safe, um, safe harbour approach. Um, what I might do is I might um, just briefly run through, I think uh, people may be familiar with what that was all about, um, but just to sort of run through very um, briefly um, why uh, there was uh, this, this safe harbour. Um, the, so the safe harbour um, product is uh, something which is um, uh, perhaps uh, it's not a sort of a, an ATO product of itself. It's a collaborative approach between the tax office and others such as Treasury and various external providers and so on. The idea of a, a safe harbour is uh, not to introduce law change but to uh, give uh, uh, taxpayers and their advisors uh, a way of, if they, if they take a particular approach, a compliance approach, um, order their, their affairs in a certain way, uh, the ATO will be happy that the particular provision is being complied with. So for example, with, with uh, the fleet car um, uh, PCG and, and Safe Harbour, um, if uh, a, a, an employer has a fleet of, of 20 or more tool of trade cars, which are not part of salary packaging arrangements, um, and they cost less than the luxury car tax limit. And if they have a mandatory logbook policy and hold valid logbooks for at least 75% of the cars in the logbook year, and it's set out um, uh, in the PCG, which is the, so the expression of the safe harbour that's been reached, um, then the ATO is comfortable that the provision has been applied with and the record keeping has been complied with. The idea of these safe harbours is to get that balance between um, saving business uh, costs on administration and red tape um, and say, if say those savings aren't outweighed by say the cost to the revenue. So it's a bit of a balancing act in that respect um, between cost savings to, to business and to the, the taxpayer community generally which we would hope to achieve and not um, costing the, the, the revenue too much. Now, uh, there are a couple of things that are very important to note. First of all, safe harbours are not uh, a new law or a new sort of mandatory process. So it, this does not mean that everybody who has fleet cards must follow the PCG. It's there as an option if um, employers wish to follow the PCG and it saves them administrative costs, um, that's, that's fine, they can take it up. Um, but it's not compulsory. Uh, it, it, it's certainly within um, the right of, of an employer to um, uh, prove their compliance with the relevant provisions in any way that they wish to. The other thing about safe harbours is that it um, is an administrative item. It's not something, it doesn't change law. We can't go outside the boundaries of the existing law. So, for example, um, when we've been discussing various safe harbours, um, uh, it's sort of, you know, for example, to say hypothetically there's a, a threshold within the, the provision of $100 or 200 kilometres or something like that, uh, we can't use the safe harbour to go above or outside those thresholds. We can only use the safe harbour approach to allow um, uh, taxpayers to demonstrate that they are within the provision. So, uh, I think sometimes it's a, a bit so the two things we've, we've had uh, feedback on with, with any sort of safe harbour, whether it be FBT or otherwise, is that I think there's a concern that it's an extra layer of administrative um, uh, requirements imposed by the ATO and certainly not um, safe harbours are a voluntary thing which is actually meant to sort of assist um, taxpayers in, in complying in a, a sort of a, an easier and cheaper way. Um, 
And the, the second misunderstanding is that somehow you can expand the um, operation of a concession or exemption and extend beyond what Parliament has intended, which unfortunately it isn't possible with the, the best will in the world. In relation to the, the, the safe harbour on, on fleet cars, we published uh, this late last year. It was our sort of our, our first um, FBT safe harbour and, and one of the, the very first PCGs. We've had quite a bit of feedback. Um, a number of questions have come in from taxpayers from the advising community and so on um, in, in response to that PCG. And, and so the number of the questions have been similar. So we've tried to sort of collate the questions and come to um, an agreed response. And we've been working with the um, FBT Safe Harbour Working Group, which Elizabeth is, is part of, to make sure that um, the responses, you know, that everybody sort of agreed what the responses are to ensure that they're, they're all consistent. Um, and we're hoping to be able to uh, publish those responses or respond to those those questions in, in some way as soon as, as soon as possible. I think we've just recently, um, I think, sort of come to a, an agreed position on a number of the questions. Uh, some of the questions that we received were simply, um, can you confirm that our understanding of what's required, um, what's a fleet car, what's a tool of trade, et cetera, is correct? And, and so our response will simply be, yep, you read it right. Um, other questions have been uh, around, you know, uh, well, the safe harbour may not benefit my particular circumstances and I'm concerned that um, it could disadvantage me. And I suppose our response to that is, uh, safe harbour is um, not a mandatory requirement. It's something that you can pick up if it suits you or leave if it doesn't suit you. Uh, and also, too, we've had some questions about, well, why couldn't you expand the safe harbour to cover things outside the provision? So we'll have to, unfortunately, our response to that will be, um, look, we are still um, uh, have to work within the boundaries of the, uh, the statutory provision. So we're hoping to get those responses um, out. We, we think that probably some of the um, questions that we've received um, have assisted us by letting us know where perhaps some of the, the, the practical compliance guidance hasn't been very clear. So it may be that we emphasise certain points or update or, or clarify things along the way. So that's sort of our, so our first foray into um, SBT Safe Harbour. So I'll, I'll allow Elizabeth and Greg to um, comment. Yeah, um, and first of all, can I just say really commend the tax office on this approach. You know, I think it's really fantastic that we're trying to look at ways, particularly with this one, we were looking at how to reduce the red tape and the, the extra admin for employers, in this case, chasing down logbooks. So, you know, to, to move away from that um, burden, burdensome requirement right at the time when you're trying to do your FBT returns is, is really great. Um, some of the particular things that I, I guess I'm hearing also from clients and that around the country were uh, questions around the impact of this on the reportable fringe benefit amount yeah. for the individual. And so I guess it's important to recognise that if the employer chooses to adopt the safe harbour, that the taxable value that's calculated for each car is what will then carry over to the, be the reportable amount on the individual's uh, payment summaries. A lot of times with these sort of um, vehicles, they're actually shared vehicles, and so as long as they're shared for private purposes, they might not be going onto reportable fringe benefit, uh, onto payment summaries. But if there is a reportable fringe benefit amount, then you know it's important to pick up the, the taxable value that's been calculated under the safe harbour if it's been adopted. And I, I guess that's where you can have winners and losers, and so that's one of the areas where it's important for the employer to decide whether this is an appropriate approach for them or not. Um, and I guess another question that comes up a lot is, does, you know, can we pick and choose who it, which cars that this applies to? So it's quite, I think it's clear in the in the guideline that, um, you know, if you choose this approach, then you must, must choose it for all of your tool of trade vehicles in the fleet. You know, the exec vehicles, sure, they're different, but um, all of those tool of trade ones, the whole the whole fleet, it's all in or, or all out. Yeah. I've got a relevant question that uh, that's just come through on on this topic, so I might just read that question out and either yourself, Greg, or, or Elizabeth could answer. So the question is, uh, for the averaging of the logbook percentage, will the average percentage be applied to the remaining 25% or to the whole fleet? The whole fleet. Yeah, yeah definitely yeah, the whole fleet. Yeah. 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 I think that's probably where the, the cost savings come in because you're not having to apply different approaches to different 
part of the fleet. And, and as I said, and, and as it was just emphasised as well too, um, it's not a compulsory. If, if the safe harbour um, would put you at a disadvantage to where you were previously, this is not a law change, um, you are still free to work as you had previously under the provisions, the safe harbour. Um, no safe harbour will ever cover 100% of the folks. Um, and look, there's a practical reason for that is um, that um, these things have to be costed and we have to have that balancing between what is it going to cost the Australian revenue versus what is it going to save the business community. And we need to kind of get to that sweet spot where um, one's not outweighing the other. Um, and that's where the, the safe harbour lands. So hopefully we get as many people um, are advantaged by the safe harbour as possible. Um, but I think there's an understanding that it, it may not be for everyone. Yeah, and I, and I recall you said that you can go back. So I'm conscious of the fact that if you do do the averaging method, you can actually uh, end up with a possibly an adverse outcome where business percentage use is actually below. Yeah, uh, and for example, if you've got a, a fleet of fleet of those tool of trade cars and and you've got a group of employees who typically do close to or on a hundred percent business use um, but when you do the averaging it comes to eighty percent you're going to have a host of employees who do not expect any value reported on their payment summary mm -hmm. so that that's probably the biggest thing for employers who yeah. are looking to use this method because you could get some disgruntled employees out of that but like Elizabeth said instigate a process where there's some rotational basis of the cars and that'll get you over that reporting for yeah. different challenge. Good. This is probably the appropriate place to um, uh, sort of flag safe harbours further on the presentation but I suppose for the sake of completeness just to mention that there are, um, we have published the fact that there are um, two other FBT safe harbours that we are looking at at the moment. Um, one of those safe harbours is the, the minor use of exempt vehicles um, and the other one is the um, interaction of minor benefits and entertainment benefits. Uh, these are two that we are, are progressing and getting feedback from working groups um, and uh, uh, costings and so forth. I think there was actually a question just under the existing law um, around what is regarded as, as minor and uh, what is regarded as infrequent. I think that was a question that was, was sent in. Um, so leaving aside perhaps the, the safe harbour approach, and I sort of had a look in, in terms of um, uh, sort of doing our background research for this, this second safe harbour that's, that's under consideration at the moment, we actually went in and had a look around you know, sort of what's the existing guidance there. And, and certainly we accept that there probably isn't a lot of um, uh, guidance on what is minor, infrequent or or irregular. Uh, there is a, we found one tax ruling from 2007 which doesn't do much more I suppose than um, say that you, you need to satisfy all of the elements um, and there are some um, some references in, in income tax and sales tax law which again probably um, don't necessarily translate uh, directly across. Um, we've found some, um, some private rulings on our, our system uh, which again are, are very fact based and I look I think Probably one thing we can say is this is quite a fact-intensive question um, and possibly one of the advantages of looking at the safe harbour is that it may um, trigger us um, to look a bit more closely around whether we can provide more useful guidance around that terminology. So again, that's probably um, a coward's way out of answering the question <laughs> because it, it, you know, what is minor, infrequent or regular? Well, it depends on the, on the facts. Um, and perhaps one useful thing that comes out of looking at this, this uh, safe harbour is that um, uh, we need to be uh, uh, provide a bit more more guidance uh, around that. But it, it is sort of a, a fact based question. I'm not sure if uh, if uh, probably can just add one thing in terms of that um, safe harbour committee and the sorts of things that we've been looking at as to whether. Um, or what would be a practical guideline to give the taxpayers? The sort of things they're considering are things like the number of times that similar entertainment benefits are provided during the year to the employee, but also coupled with that, the total value of those benefits across the year. Um, but also recognising then it probably depends on the individual values of those benefits as well. So there's kind of three factors there to try and 
marry up and to have coming up with something that's very simple isn't actually that easy because <laughs> we don't want too many tiers and make it complicated for taxpayers to actually be able to apply. More to complicated pay than what we started mm. off with, yeah. Mm. And look, that's and it's part of the element too in in relation to the um, uh, minor benefit uh, rule relating to um, uh, entertainment and, and so forth. Again, it's a question of if we're going to have a safe harbour, getting that feedback from from industry and from Elizabeths and Greggs of this world around what should that safe harbour um, cover? What are the most pertinent and relevant benefits that are most used and of the most um, concern, I suppose, to, to industry as well too? And, and that's sort of the part of the, the process in terms of formulating the safe harbour approach. Um, can I ask a question, uh, which I think maybe a few people on the, the webinar will want to be asking as well. Um, do you have any gauge on timing of when this might be resolved? Because I understand the complexity, but is there any? We, yeah, I think we, we, we extend out the timing. I think what uh, it says on our website at the moment is June 2017. We didn't want to dump something on people just before SBT year end and then um, you know, because obviously um, people need to have the chance to assess whether the safe harbour is going to be relevant. We, we got the um, the fleet car one out hopefully in reasonable time in advance of the, the SBT year. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, safe harbour on the I don't think I'm speaking out of term. I say the safe harbour on the um, uh, the minor and frequent use of uh, motor vehicles is perhaps a, a little bit more advanced. Um, uh, because uh, perhaps it, it sort of uh, has a, a narrower um, uh, range of, of benefits that it covers um, and uh, I think it's a case of making sure that costings are sustainable and um, making sure that uh, we proceed to drafting a, a PCG that um, the PCG is clear and I think again our experience with the fleet cars will hopefully inform when we do draft um, if we do draft a PCG around the um, exempt vehicles, it will hopefully be um, nice and clear. Uh, the third uh, safe harbour I referred to the entertainment um, and minor benefits. Um, again, that's perhaps um, what we actually catch within that. I think is the is a, is a question, mm. and um, we need to sort of get that before you can cost something and, and send it off and, and be costed through the, the relevant. We need to sort of know what we're what we're actually pinning down to cost. Yeah. And entertainment by far is the category of benefits, if I use that term, that where people would look to use the minor benefit exemption because that, that does have in most businesses an ad hoc nature to it, so, mm. um, albeit the challenge of identifying who's attended various events becomes a challenge. Yeah. So um, we certainly um, would like to um, keep, things, keep things moving along. Um, in that regard, but we we want to make sure that um, uh, we have the, the figures right, and we also have a safe harbour which will actually be useful to people and, mm. and not create more red tape than um, what they have. Similar been. issues, I guess, arise with the exempt vehicles, one, the utes and panel vans and things, and what's minor there. So if you set a safe harbour of I don't know a certain number of kilometres for the year that could be travelled for private purposes, and and we accept that as minor. Are we comfortable that it's easy for employers to track, you know, those number of kilometres? Mm -hmm. So they're the kinds of things that the community is trying to get its head around, and making sure that this is actually a reduction in compliance costs, not an increase. And and you look at um, again different industries, different types of employers have different usages of vehicles in different locations, and. and Again, you sort of start off with something that looks quite simple, but then mm. everybody puts their ten cents worth in, and you realise um, there are there are different permutations. Do we have time for one more question on cars yeah. before we move on? Yeah, uh, it's just come through. I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, so the question is, what about if you have a consolidated tax group and each individual employing members has less than twenty cars, but in aggregate all employing members have well over twenty cars? Can the group use this ruling? And then it follows on to say, if one vehicle is above LCT threshold but all others are below, can you still use the threshold? So because SBT is 
um, paid by an employer and there's no grouping from uh, an FBT perspective, then each employer would have to consider their fleet separately. So yeah, it, the, the individual entities that had more than 20 cars could adopt the safe harbour but the others could not. Mm. Okay, the, the next slide, we called FET errors to watch. Um, simply we're noting these because these are things where we've had queries or we've had requests or we've had comments from the public or the media's expressed an interest. Um, so we, we're flagging these um, as areas of, of interest as opposed to perhaps in a couple of the slides on we'll talk about things perhaps where we have a, a def definite work plan or, or say a program where we're going to be looking at, at things in particular. Um, I, I think I promised uh, one of the, the attendees here that uh, who said that they were overhearing about LASA. <laughs> um, I won't speak too much about LASA but um, look, LASA we do, uh, we have had inquiries um, about uh, uh, the allowances where, where um, the arrangements extend beyond 12 months and we've also had some practical inquiries around the declaration form um, and uh, some, some potential issues around those. Uh, we are aware that um, some of the guidance on this issue um, is limited and uh, in some cases uh, there is, uh, most people are probably aware, that it's, it's been on our register that there is a ruling um, process underway for travel expenses and allowances and so forth which will encompass both of income tax and FBT and, and other related issues. It's going to be quite a, a big one when it, it gets going. Um, that also um, has some interplay with, with the, the LAFA issues as well too. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted to... Not on that, not on that topic. I've got a question <laughs> on, on LAFA. So the prospect of the ATO providing an update of more modern interpretation of travel versus LAF was raised at various seminars during 2016, uh, meant to be released during 2016. Do we have an ATO update? Um, you... uh, my understanding is that um, we don't have a specific date yet. Um, there has been quite a bit of work done um, and uh, we are hoping sooner rather than later, which again probably isn't a, uh, a great answer, but um, uh, as soon as we can announce something we will. And maybe maybe we've got a bit more flexibility in um, making a comment on that without being held to, <laughs> to account on it. Um, there, there has been a lot of work that's gone into that particular ruling. Um, and both Elizabeth and I were involved in the consultation close consultation on it and it is it is close albeit there are some that ruling or that draft ruling is going to raise and cover a lot of practical examples that reflect a, a modernized view of business travel and living away from home which which are different to a lot of the precedents that have existed historically based on the travel remain arrangements that were in place 20, 30, 50, 60 years ago when some of these precedents were created um, given their income tax background as well. So a lot of efforts going in to make this draft ruling something that's really practical as well for, for taxpayers. So um, when it comes out I think most people will be impressed by what it's covered based on what we've seen so far. And look, being specific perhaps to provide some assistance to particular industries which have um, particular issues attached to them as well too. Obviously there are certain industries which um, from the approaches we have have particular interest in these sorts of issues. We've had the John Holland uh, case again which has required uh, some, some further thought um, and uh, consideration as well too. Uh, um, move on to the benefits provided to overseas employees. Again, um, we raise this simply because, look, we do get a lot of inquiries um, on these issues. I think when we were initially having a session before this webinar and we were talking about overseas employees, uh, I think we were sort of looking at um, uh, sending Australian employees overseas and benefits that might be provided to them. But I think it's also worth considering, and again, this is where we have that intersection of, of FBT and income tax, and um, it's difficult sometimes to dissect the two. We're also looking at um, 
people who uh, come from overseas and who are brought into Australia to perform particular roles. And there have been some changes on the income tax side in the last 12, 24 months um, relating to Section 23 AG of the Income Tax Act. Um, we do get inquiries that come out of that which also raise um, um, FBT issues as well too. Um, just broadly, in terms of people coming to Australia, what's the correct um, treatment? Are they employees of Australian Arms? What are their PAYG um, obligations? What are the FBT obligations? Um, we get a lot of queries around what's the best way to go um, in terms of direct reimbursement of expenses and, and costs uh, versus providing someone with an allowance to cover costs um, and, and those are the sorts of issues um, we, we, we sort of seen coming into us and, and I think there was a question that was sent in um, prior to the webinar which was um, were there any tips or tricks around uh, uh, employers when they're, they're dealing with overseas employees and probably the ATO shouldn't be talking in terms of advising on tricks. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure, uh, I, suppose, I suppose in terms of uh, tips or issues uh, I think probably we do get a lot of questions around what is the best way to cover costs and expenses, um, uh, you know, sort of reimbursements, allowances, um, additional salary amounts. There are a number of different ways that these can be covered, um, making available services and so forth, and just to um, perhaps uh, canvas what the correct treatment of those items are in terms of both income tax and FBT and other obligations, not to sort of look at those in isolation as just an income tax issue or an FBT issue. Um, but I'll hand over to Elizabeth and Greg. Yeah, I, I, no, I just wanted to sort of raise three layers of not necessarily tricks but <laughs> tips and things to consider, if I put it that way. Uh, so it's important first to get the classification right between whether someone's travelling on business versus living away from home because the various concessions and opportunities that go with those classifications are different. Um, I think that's a polite way of <laughs> saying tricks. Um, if, if it is living away from home, understand the, um, the challenges that exist under the new law about employees being required to maintain a, a residency that's available for their, their enjoyment and understanding um, the rules and restrictions around that. Uh, and probably the thing that's most complex and gets a lot of employers into some difficulty is looking at the various treaty related relief that might exist um, when you're entering different jurisdictions. Um, and some of that also hinges on who, which, who is the employer and who's the economic employer who's bearing the costs of that, that particular travel or, or secondment arrangement. So getting your head around those three issues in connection um, is what puts you in the best place to get the, the best outcome for the employer and employee. I guess we're still getting questions around those <coughs> the expats that are going out of Australia, working overseas and where they're being paid by an offshore entity perhaps and perhaps not part of the PAYG or FBT rules that, that perhaps still resident and paying tax here and how do we value those non-cash benefits um, uh, well, that can actually be an FBT issue or an income tax issue, and so there's still a bit of uncertainty uh, around that, and, and it's actually happening quite a lot. <laughs> the third, the third item I've identified there is, is an old friend, car parking. Um, <laughs> there's obviously ongoing discussion and work um, in terms of refreshing the um, car parking uh, public ruling post the, the Qantas decision. Um, again, I am very hopeful that this um, public ruling is uh, close, getting closer rather than further away. Um, uh, I'm being kept up to date on a daily basis and again probably I'm, I'm restricted from saying, saying more than that. In terms of uh, car parking issues generally, so one thing that's um, uh, I suppose a practical assistance is that I believe we've published recently um, or we can make available a checklist uh, if people are lodging objections on car parking issues, uh, there's a checklist on information and, and issues that should be addressed in the objection which will um, assist our teams at the ATO to streamline your objection um, and get it out more quickly. So I would certainly suggest that if you are looking at lodging an objection or that, just use that, that um, checklist as a, 
a bit of a guide as to um, the sorts of things that um, should be covered off. The other thing that I'll, I'll mention around car parking is that we get, uh, we have had a, a number of uh, questions and approaches around valuation of car parking. Um, and this was something which wasn't specifically covered in the Qantas case and hasn't been traditionally sort of covered off um, in the, the, the public ruling as it exists to date. Um, we've had uh, ruling requests, we've had um, objections, self-objections, we've had people ringing us just saying we've been approached by people purporting to be valuers. We're not sure if their valuation approaches are correct. Their valuations perhaps seem, the numbers seem a bit a bit low, um, you know, uh, what do we do? Uh, we, we get inquiries of those natures as well, too. I won't call them Dobbins, but people who are sort of concerned who, who ring us. And, and I suppose valuation of car parking is um, something that um, uh, has been raised with us as, as something that we, we should be watching and we should be looking at. Um, obviously, we're not in the business of telling people how to do um, their valuations because they're qualified valuers. Um, and it's not our business to, to tell them how to do their valuations, but certainly if there are things that cause concerns such as um, particular valuations being greatly lower than what um, other valuers are, are providing, um, if we have some, some concerns about the, the arm's length nature um, of uh, valuations or other things that raise concerns, valuations that um, uh, don't appear to take into account relevant considerations or ignore um, information we think you know sort of is relevant pertaining to what's what's being valued. They're the sorts of things that are so it's not just for FBT purposes and car parking purposes, but they're the sorts of things that um, attract our attention in relation to any sort of valuation uh, approach. So this is something really where I think the ATO is being told uh, or being asked to sort of say, well, what are you doing about this? And and that's why we've, we've flagged it as perhaps a, an area to watch. I'm happy to uh, uh, probably the only thing that I would I would mention is this is again the area of car parking is another situation of where the law was developed with a specific type of car parking environment in place where you know 20 years ago plus most of the car parking was provided in what looks like everyone thinks of a commercial car parking station um, nowadays with various online portals and mediums, you you can hire a car park from someone living in a residential tower who doesn't have a car and wants to rent out their their single car space. And unfortunately that under the broad definition of commercial parking station within the FBT legislation constitutes a commercial parking station. So um, that I think is providing a number of challenges, not just to the ATO in determining whether TR 9626 still has broad application and is relevant, but also it probably is causing Treasury some concerns as well about how they want to tax car parking. And look, another issue that, um, again, it reflects the, the rapidly changing world and, and technology um, under the heading of car parking, which has been brought to our attention, we've sort of raised it on our website, but again, it's, it's something where we're still looking at it is in the context of the, the ever-expanding sharing economy, um, uh, you know, sort of the, the Airbnb equivalent of, of car parking. Anybody these days with a, a mobile phone and an app can um, uh, provide parking and, and that raises um, issues and, and people come to us and say, well, we've, we've been offered this um, this parking opportunity. What do we do to comply with our SBT obligations or an employer? You know, so should we be taking up this opportunity? So it's a, it's a rapidly changing environment. From a, from a somewhat independent point of view, I think this, if any, any of the fringe benefit tax legislation needs reform. It's the area of car parking to bring it up to take into account the modern day scenarios. Um, I'll move on to, to loan and debt waivers. Uh, this really comes onto our screen more because in the context of uh, payroll errors. Um, we seem to have had a, a run of, of these inquiries uh, where people have been, uh, employees have been overpaid, um, there have been arrangements made um, to allow um, the overpaid salary or wages or entitlements to be to be paid back interest free. Technically, that creates um, a, a loan benefit. Um, how do we value that? Does that fall within the the minor benefits? What happens if it's a one-off thing? It, 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 you know, looking at the benchmark rate, it may well 
um, fall below the, the minor benefit threshold, so that's all dandy. What happens if it happens again and again, um, or if there are other payroll or other um, loans that have been provided to the employee, do we aggregate them? Um, again, this is something which is highly factual. You know, if, if it's a an occasional error where you know we don't want to sort of um, penalise um, an employee um, where it's been a, uh, an error on the part of the employer or, or the software, the payroll software has gone berserk or something like that, and, and there's sort of a genuine need to to repay and, and formalise arrangements. Um, I, I suppose if if this was starting to happen with a particular employer on a regular basis, or if we had any concerns that was, there was some mischief and that there were sort of you know disguised loans, that would be the sort of thing where we would be looking at. So I suppose the message there is um, certainly um, bring any questions and queries to us. Um, if, it, if there are genuine errors and, and these things happen, um, particularly with employers with large payrolls where it's automated, these things do happen and we're not necessarily out to um, to get those sorts of situations. Um, I suppose um, if there's any sort of indication of a non-arms length um, arrangement or agreement between employer and employee, um, I think again it ties into some of perhaps the benefits that are, are provided in, in closely held companies. But in most cases, it shouldn't be of concern to us if it's just a genuine error and, and their arrangement to repay. But it does seem to be happening quite a bit. I can also suggest that um, <clears throat> where employers have got this issue with salary overpayments, and particularly where it's a larger amount, um, might have been something that's happened over a number of years before it's been detected perhaps, and it goes over the $300 mm -hmm. threshold perhaps. One way to consider um, addressing it is instead of having the employee repay um, the overpayment from after-tax dollars, which would be a loan fringe benefit, is to um, look at entering into effectively a salary sacrifice arrangement, but agreeing to pay the employee less gross pay, because that means there's no actual repayment as such, and to be a loan fringe benefit, there has to be an obligation to repay. So if you've agreed to receive less gross salary in the future, that's not agreeing to repay anything, and therefore sort of removes the, the possibility of there being a loan fringe benefit. That can get difficult when it straddles different financial years, um, but if it's in the same financial year, then that's um, a good way to, to look at it. I think the best advice is to take advice. <laughs> you know, yep. If it's a genuine error, we, we don't want to um, be imposing unnecessary obligations um, if, it's, if it's a genuine error. I'll just mention, we, we've obviously had a bit of a discussion about the, the safe harbour approach um, entertainment and minor benefits. Um, we get lots of questions about these. We particularly get a lot of questions about Christmas parties um, and just some of those practical difficulties in determining. Um, you know, it's a highly factual uh, sort of um, query. You know, when we're providing, when there are benefits being provided, the frequency, the nature of the benefits, um, it's something that um, really does come across our, our radar quite a bit. We um, we have on the ATO talk and, and let's talk uh, section of, of our website, we have material, we've had some, some video presentations and, and some uh, webinars uh, both for the, the um, mainstream employers and for the not-for-profit sector simply because we do get such a, a run of these queries particularly coming up to the, the celebratory season and so on. Yeah, I thought I might just jump in. Uh, there was an interesting question that was raised on the gala dinner exemptions. Uh, maybe we'll get some insight on that in terms of what you can cannot exempt. Uh, look, I think I suppose um, our answer to that is, um, uh, and I did have an answer to that, is that um, it is very much um, a question of um, what's reasonably incidental to, uh, if we're talking about a dinner following some sort of work um, seminar or, or work related um, activity, what's reasonably incidental? Um, uh, it, we, we have some, some basic guidance in terms of what we might look at being reasonably incidental if it's provided for sustenance because of the duration, time of day or location of the seminar, if it's provided immediately before, during, um, or immediately following working sessions, um, if it's available to all seminar participants and, and not just a, a select and blessed few. Um, so uh, what we would say is do an analysis of the why, what, when and where. Um, 
why the food or drink is being provided, is it for refreshment or for a, a social purpose, uh, what type of food or drink is being provided, um, uh, the, the next question of whether there's alcohol provided as well too, when is the food or drink being provided, um, is it just before, just after or during the seminar, um, if, it, if it has that the sort of close um, timing connection to the actual uh, work related seminar then it perhaps is more likely to be um, classified as sustenance and not as, as entertainment. Again, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a judgment call and where the food or drink is being provided. Um, again, if you go off to off-site to um, try to think what's, what's a fashionable place to go to these days, I can't really think of anything, um, as opposed to um, having the misery of something in your, your corporate um, meeting room which I've endured on many occasions, <laughs> then um, you know, obviously if you're on business premises, again, that's one of those factors where it swings more likely and in, in in sort of on the side of, of being related to the the, um, the work attendance. So um, I suppose the person who looked at this question to me said, look, you know, gala dinner sometimes could have an inference that something more than simple sustenance is being provided. Um, if you've got a cabaret performance or a band, that, that might make it look more like entertainment than, um, than something which is, is reasonably incidental to um, work attendance. So I suppose the best advice is to really be certain of all, all the facts, ask, um, compare to the guidance on our website and ask those questions around the why, what, when and where of the, the food and drink being provided. So I'll hand over to Elizabeth and Greg. No, okay with that. Yeah, and, you know, sort of test is whether you've you've gone the next step of organising entertainment or whether you're simply having a, a big dinner at the end of the conference. Um, you know, if it's just a big dinner and maybe there's a few speeches and awards or something, then we'd probably tend to think that that's still sustenance. But as you say, if you've got the cabaret show happening, and look, probably gone into look at the marketing materials around it. You know, if it's if it's pitched as a celebration or a, an entertainment related event, that, that makes it difficult to argue that it's purely sustenance. Whereas mm -hmm. if it, it's viewed as part of the conference agenda, um, then that's starting to feel a bit more like soft. Yes, yes. I, I conference, um, work conference recently uh, had down the bottom in capital letters, attendance is mandatory, which um, <laughs> uh, I can show you it was not going to be entertaining at all. So. <laughs> Didn't say you shall not be entertained. Uh, I think that was given. <laughs> okay. um, keep in mind the time as well too. Um, ATOSBP compliance focus. We actually have a section on our website called What Attracts Our Attention and uh, as the name suggests, uh, these are the things that we're going to have a close look at going forward. Now, we have the general What Attracts Our Attention, um, which is across all income tax and FBT issues and, and a range of corporate governance type issues, you know, dodgy record keeping or no record keeping whatsoever, um, bad systems, all those sorts of things. Within that, we have a specific um, what attracts our attention um, FBT uh, uh, section, uh, and I do suggest that gets updated as priorities shift and change. We used to publish sort of a, a very specific compliance program. This is what we shall be auditing this year. What we do now is we, we indicate the issues of interest to us um, that attract our attention, what our compliance focus is. Um, that's sort of the, the format that we take at the moment. Now, there's some old friends uh, here, uh, late lodgements, lapsed lodgers. Um, there's not really what much one can say about that, um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's an ongoing issue that people don't lodge their returns, they're late, and there's no explanation or, or reason why. So that always is an area of concern to us. I wanted to mention just um, briefly the SBT tax gap. That's a, there's a, a focus area. Um, the tax gap project is something that the ATO has been looking at recently. It's something which has probably been uh, a focus in other jurisdictions that certainly come to, um, to be an item of interest to us. Tax gap, um, there's discussion um, on our website at the moment, more in the context of income tax and GST. The tax gap is really a, a process for seeing what the difference is between a sort of a perfectly functioning system. So in other words, if you have the right guidance and if you have the right support systems and if you have everything in place which um, enables taxpayers to 
do their tax properly and record properly and um, record and pay the right amount. Compare that to what is actually being paid and recorded. And that gap, um, how big that gap is and, and where that gap arises um, gives uh, uh, taxing authorities such as the ATO guidance um, around where to focus compliance activities and also um, guidance products as well too. So uh, I suppose what we need to emphasise here is this is not about um, asking taxpayers to pay, to, to lodge a, an extra return called the, the tax gap return or to provide extra information. It's about a different approach to measuring, I suppose, the success and the health of the tax system generally rather than sort of looking completely backwards and saying, well, this is how much we collected last year and, and um, you know, we sort of uh, say well, this is how much we expect to, connect, to, to collect to hopefully next year. It's about saying what should be payable if things are working properly and assuming that if you put all the right systems in place and you give people the right education, the right support and you make sure that they have functioning um, digital products and, and uh, online lodgement services and all those things work properly, um, it's the assumption that people will comply with their tax obligations if they're given the tools and support to do that. Only, only a very small percentage of people will deliberately not want to. And so obviously we'd like to narrow the gap between what should be paid if everything's functioning well versus what is actually being paid. Because the, the larger the gap, that suggests that there's something not functioning right in the tax system. So the focus to date has been around income tax and GST. Um, SBT obviously can't be sort of left out of the equation. The sorts of things that look at in the, the tax gap, um, it's not about policy changes. So if the government makes a specific decision to create an exemption or a concession or extend an exemption or a concession, um, that isn't um, about the tax gap, that's a policy decision. So we raise this simply because the communications that will be coming out the way um, uh, we look at um, how well the tax system is working, um, is going to start talking about this tax gap concept and it's going to have an impact on um, perhaps how the, the guidance that we put out and the, the compliance activities we undertake, what those ones are and where they're targeted. So it's more sort of an information, working from the information we already have. Um, just want to reassure people that it's not about get, having to go out and get ex extra information, extra returns um, um, from, from taxpayers um, at all. Um, and I suppose this is an early stage thing. At the moment it's about making sure that the information we do have is, is sort of credible and reliable, I think are the two, the two phrases, um, to make sure that um, if we do see a tax gap that we, we know where it's come from and why. Um, car fringe benefits. Um, uh, look, there was a, a consultation pro, uh, process recently on car fringe benefits uh, and particularly whether Division 2 of, of the fringe benefits legislation uh, needed updating whether we needed to have separate guidance on that, particularly on concepts as such as what is private use and own use of, own use of cars. Um, that, that consultation process took place. We received feedback on that. At this stage, we believe there probably isn't um, a need for a whole series of new public rulings and public determinations and so forth, which you know that could take a while to actually get to people. We think at this stage the best way to um, present that feedback and get the extra guidance out there is by updating the relevant sections of the ATO's online employer guide. It's probably a much faster way of downloading that information um, in a useful fashion. So you will probably see that employer guide, the online product being, being updated. Again, um, the, the fourth bullet point there um, is, oh sorry, there was a question to about the exempt uh, vehicle leases um, and why they have been taken off website, there have been a listing of, um, sorry, exempt vehicles I should say, there have been a listing um, and they've been taken off. We had some feedback that um, from the public that some of the um, vehicles on the list probably shouldn't have been there, so we want to go back and have a look at that. Overall, we wanted to go to a more principles based approach, in other words, um, rather than sort of listing specific cars uh, and vehicles to say, look, these are the criteria that would meet exemption, hopefully being you know, sort of fairly clear what those criteria are. Um, we've had some, some feedback that people do like the listing concept, so I believe when we've made sure that the what current information is right, there will be a, a list put back on the system. It may even have appeared um, 
with that too. With some of the older cars, it's very difficult to actually get information on pre-2000 vehicles, what their features are. Um, not many people drive them anymore. Um, once that list goes back on the system, over time there will be a transitioning to more principle-based approach, but there will be an explanation as to how that is going to transition across. So but we do um, understand that some people were um, attached to the, the list. It's just been that we had some concerns about whether it was actually accurate or not. Um, housing fringe benefits, again, this is just something where we've had a, um, a run of, of queries. Um, incorrect claiming of SBT exemptions or SBT rebates. Um, again, I suppose that's um, just a, an ongoing issue around um, uh, misunderstandings. And again, we need to understand whether it's um, a lack of guidance, a lack of education products. Uh, that um, makes that a, an issue. Um, <clears throat> employee reward programs, uh, going back way back when, I remember a long time ago I was involved in, in some of the, before I joined the ATO, some of the work around the old loyalty programs and there's been some advice and guidance about loyalty programs and, and frequent flyer programs and all those sorts of things. Um, over time, um, and yeah, those were sort of third party arrangements, third party providers. Over time there have been um, various programs provided by employers to employees and I suppose it ties into the next bullet point about benefits provided directly to private companies. Where do these um, rewards cross the line and really should be part of salary and wages um, as opposed to something which is a, a sort of a, a, a special reward? Uh, some description. We also see that um, employee rewards, you know, it's such a movie of frequent flyer type program, but now we're seeing employee rewards being provided in so many different ways. So whether it be by um, vouchers for products, the employer's products, or other products, um, monetary rewards, um, uh, you know, um, prepaid. Uh, cards, some description, all sorts of different ways that rewards can be provided, services, again services provided by the employer or services provided by a third party being given to the employee. It's just a question of um, there are so many different permutations. Um, we need to look at this and see if we need to provide guidance, if there are things that are really salary or wages which are being um, put into a, a different format. And again, benefits provided direct to the private companies. Again, uh, we have seen numerous examples, perhaps, where um, services, products, amounts, whatever, have been given to directors, which should really be recorded as fringe benefit or as salary or wages or income of some description, um, but have not been recorded appropriately. So um, that's uh, sort of uh, where we are on those compliance topics and I'll hand over to Elizabeth or Greg. Just quickly on the reward programs, I think the critical thing there is whether the minor benefit exemption can apply or not and the critical point there is whether it's actually being provided as a reward for services that, that knocks it out um, or that's one of the main factors to consider in whether it would qualify as a minor benefit or not. So, so in our experience, I guess the more formal the program, and the more known about the benefit of achieving a certain KPI or whatever, then the more likely it's a fringe benefit. Um, whereas the more sort of ad hoc, thank you for doing a great job last week kind of thing is more likely to fit under that minor exemption. Yeah. And, and, and as I said, you have, you have different permutations. Mm -hmm. um, one which has been on our website because obviously it's been part of a, a public class ruling was a, almost like a you get a, a, a ticket in a competition. Um, which sort of again removes, but you can only get a ticket if you're an employee who's mm. done certain things. So you, you get your ticket and get absolutely nothing, or you get a ticket and get something mm. wonderful. And again, evaluations I should mention too, when you have all these weird and wonderful different sorts of rewards, obviously if you get a, a, a voucher for a particular amount, okay, but um, if it's a service of some description, how you value that, again that feeds into the line of benefit considerations and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, Consultation, we may have actually covered off on a few of these things. I've explained around um, and some, some sort of overlap with the first two bullet points, Safe Harbour Working Group um, continues to work very hard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the SBT and Remuneration Safe Harbours, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest 
in, in these, these subjects and certainly industry input and, and input from taxpayers about what are their big concerns around red tape, what are their administrative costs, what is causing them a hassle is, is really important because that will allow us to identify where a safe harbour might be of great assistance. Um, there is a paper out there, I think the comments have actually closed, that domestic travel allowances, reasonable rates, safe harbours for meals, incidentals and accommodations. Look, um, we've just had, um, there seems to be some disparity in some cases between allowances paid and deductions claimed. So we're asking ourselves why is it because, again, we haven't got the right guidance out there, people are confused about what they can and can't do. What's the reason behind this? So there has been a discussion paper and a, a consultation site. I think uh, the actual feedback's closed now, but it's still a very useful thing to read to understand what some of the issues are and, and what the questions are that we're, we're curious to understand where the gaps might be. Um, and again, travelling and living away from home deductions for work-related travel expenses. Keep your eyes peeled for a, a uh, formal guidance product. Ditto for car parking fringe benefits. Keep your eyes peeled, but don't hold your breath. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, for one, would be very, very happy to see some resolution on the car parking for insurance. Yes. <laughs> that, was, that was very insightful. Thank you, uh, Catherine. And, uh, some great commentary from uh, Elizabeth and Greg as well. We've had great participation, actually, while the conversation was going ahead in the presentation, so it was in excess of 15 questions raised. Um, in addition to the questions that was raised prior to the session, which, which I believe was pretty much addressed, I'm quite comfortable that most of those areas have been touched on. So, uh, we are okay to extend this for a couple of more minutes, yeah, perhaps yeah. a few more questions. Uh, we may not get through all of them. As I said, there have been 15 questions out of those 15. We've probably addressed a couple during the presentation, but uh, right. there was one which, uh, which came in uh, in no uncertain order, but there was one that would is probably of relevance to the audience, I believe, and it was around any potential act audit activity that the ATO is looking to undertake. Uh, there was an assertion by one of the attendees that they overheard that uh, there would be something happening in the FBT space. So just some comments on that, please. Okay, well look, our, what attracts our attention is, is um, even though it's not formally called uh, sort of an audit um, uh, program, uh, those what attracts our attention issues are an indication of the things that our audit teams will be looking for. And bearing in mind that we don't necessarily sort of do FBT on its own. Um, you know, it, it could be tied in with, with other employer obligations and then FBT, FBT issues arise. And you can see from some of the things that are what attracts our attention, um, you know, it, a lot of them have a, an interaction if there's a, an issue perhaps with income tax and uh, reporting of employer obligations in that space, FBT is probably a, a natural thing. Um, in terms of, I suppose one of the other things I'd say is, in terms of when issues arise, it's a question of what's the best way to treat them. Um, sometimes audit is the right way forward. Other times, for example, if you have concerns around valuations, and this is just a high level, it's not anything specific, but Sometimes there are better ways of working through valuation issues. If there's a, a difference of view between experts or difference of approaches, um, we have a, a much more flexible approach around you know, sort of expert conferencing and, and those sorts of things these days where it may be more productive for people with different views to get together in a room, I think they call it a hot tub in some, conjures up horrible images, but anyway, <laughs> um, to get uh, experts with differing views to explain their views, see where the the, sort of the, the areas of departure are understand methodologies better, so um, not automatically a sort of an ordered approach. But the best indication of the sorts of things that are concerning us is what attracts our attention. We've actually seen a lot more payroll tax audits recently to do with what taxpayers are declaring uh, in terms of their fringe benefits. So that sort of matching between the state revenue offices and the ATO about getting the right amount for your fringe benefits in your payroll tax return seems to be a hot issue at the moment. I can certainly, uh, certainly relate to some of those. Uh, the SROs have been quite active, I think, in data matching and getting increasingly more sophisticated in terms of how they identify potential discrepancies. Having said that, those discrepancies aren't always as they seem to be. So, yeah. Same with WorkSafe authorities as well. Yeah. 
Thanks. So the other questions are sort of fairly topical and go back to uh, some of the areas that we've covered earlier. So there's one on LAFAs, and it talks about uh, if an employee has been out on site for more than 12 months and we continue to pay LAFA, which is tax, is a declaration still required even though the concession doesn't apply? Well, there's no need for it because there's nothing to exempt. Yeah. So I was just trying to think whether technically under the law there is, but um, but there'd be no need for it because you're paying full FBT on that allowance after the 12 month limit anyway. Okay. I think that's a, that's a good response. A um, couple of more that have come through, as I said, we probably won't cover all of them, uh, just given that we're, we're over time already, but uh, there's one on, on FIFO uh, related issues. And it goes on to say, uh, will the travel ruling cover implications of FIFO flights changing their return flight? Uh, and then uh, sub question to that is, has there been or there likely to be any review on the definition of remote areas for things like remote area housing benefits? Some once remote towns are now classified as cities. Uh, so the first, the first half of that, and trying to rem so there definitely are examples in the version I saw that talks about that sort of fly in fly out drive in dry out but I can't remember the specific about changing um, location I can't remember that as a specific example that was covered um, uh, and the the latter one the housing one changing remote area um, look the only thing I'd say on that is if we're talking about changing the definitions around what is remote, um, that's a policy slash legislative issue um, and uh, to, a certain, well, to a great extent the APO is sort of in the hands of, of, um, uh, of Treasury and Parliament on that one. In terms of what the APO can have an input in those sorts of issues, if, 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 there, is a, if, if there is a policy change proposed and on any issue then usually we're consulted about you know what the ramifications might be, but it's not for us to um, actually change it. If there's a concern about um, uh, some lack of clarity about how the remote um, area provisions are administered in terms of not perhaps um, not having the right guidance or so on, um, I'm trying to think. I think there. Is a list, a very lengthy list of different towns and areas on the website which are regarded as, as um, remote. I'm not aware of that having been updated very recently. Um, but again, I think that's just based on existing law. Yep. So I think it's just a question that law change is kind of outside um, the scope of our responsibility for what we can do. Right. Have we got time for the last question or a couple of more? What are we thinking? One yep. more? Yep. So this question is about uh, FBT accommodation. So overseas employees are required to pay FBT on accommodation. Did you mention earlier a change to the pro rata, the FBT concessional cap applying to PBIs if an employee leaves part way through the FBT year? Uh, so the concessional cap part of that question, that applies per employee, per employer, per FBT year. So if employees join or leave, in fact, during an FBT year, there's no need to pro rata. The whole capped amount can be provided in their period of employment with that particular employer for the year. Um, and one employee could move between three different employers in a year and get the cap three times, once with each different employer. Yeah. And then the other part, was actually the first part, was are the overseas employees required to pay FBT on their accommodation? Oh, right. So uh, the answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, and it will depend on, the, on a number of factors um, uh, to do with whether the employee's salary is uh, subject to PAYG withholding in Australia or not, and also who's actually the employer, is it the overseas entity or is it the Australian entity? So um, that's probably one where we'd say give us some more details and then we'll be able to give the proper answer. Yeah, there's too many variables. Yeah, I 
I agree. So, I think we, that was probably one of those long-winded ones where you could, <laughs> you could write a couple of pages worth, worth of advice. Yeah, it just simply can be yes and it can be no, yeah. depending on yeah. the very fact. All right. Well, I think that was a that was a very well covered uh, session, and also some very very questions. Uh, great insight both from the panel and uh, uh, Catherine. Thanks again for your uh, delivery today. Um, with nothing further to be said, I'm sure if anyone's got any last comments or questions. Thanks for having us. So with that you, we might conclude today's session. Thank you all. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you to Catherine for today's presentation and to Greg, Elizabeth and Sasha for their input. If we didn't get a chance to answer all of your questions, we'll make sure to follow up via email or phone. To all of you, have a great day.